everyone did people who are joining we're letting people kind of roll in so we'll probably get started in 30 seconds to a minute or so Okay, hi everyone again. We're still letting people roll in for people who just recently joined. Okay, looks like the attendance count is starting to slow down a little bit. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Cameron Pfeiffer. I'll be moderating today's version of the Microstructure Exchange Emerging Scholars Edition. Uh, we have uh, Alexei Ivashenko. Um, who's at uh, University of Lausanne, and he's going to be moving to VU Amsterdam soon. And uh, we have Edie Hotchkiss, who's going to be doing the discussion section. Um, also, just a happy uh, Bastille Day to all of our French listeners. If you are French and here, uh, we appreciate that you're spending your, your evening here instead of, uh, you know, doing whatever it is you do at Bastille Day. I don't know. Um, and uh, I just want to give everyone a reminder about the, the format for the Emerging Scholar session because it's a little different than the traditional format. Um, there will be 30 minutes uninterrupted uh, of presentation from Alexi. Um, then we'll have Edie's discussion for 15 minutes. And then there's going to be a 15 minute open Q&A at the end. Um, you can type your questions into the Q&A function and we'll, we can keep track of them uh, for the Q&A session at the end. Um, and you can also ask uh, Alexi questions directly. We'll enable the raise hand function so you can you can speak. Okay, uh, I think that's all I have to say on housekeeping items. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Alexi. Thank you, thank you, Cameron. Uh, so I hope you can see and hear me well now. Uh, thanks guys for, uh, for having me today. This is an honor to be part of this um, impressive series of talks. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about price reversals and corporate bonds as my title slide suggests. And in particular, uh, I'm going to investigate what price reversals and corporate bonds have to say about adverse selection risk in corporate bond trading. To introduce the topic, let me first give you a couple of numbers. So I have a small table here that basically shows that pre-2008 crisis, the average daily trading volume uh, in, in American corporate bonds was about five times lower than the average end of day dealers inventory. So in 2017, some years later, after the crisis and post-crisis regulation, the same ratio became about 10 times lower. Uh, so nowadays, the US inventory in American corporate bonds are like half of the daily trading bulk. So in other words, dealers became extremely uh, inventory averse, if I may. So they tried to offset in terms of uh, daily trading volume, many more trades within the same day. So they don't take bonds into, uh, into inventory overnight. If, if they face a 10 million buy transaction, they try to shop around and see whether there is someone who is ready to uh, trade in the reverse direction. And if there is, they execute both trades simultaneously. In other words, investors, bond investors, become liquidity providers together with uh, traditional corporate bond dealers. So there is a growing literature that looks into this phenomenon of uh, non-deal liquidity provision in corporate bonds. And in this particular paper, um, I will try to see of these two types of liquidity providers, bond investors and bond dealers, which one is more likely to be adversely selected? Which one is more likely to face informed order flow? Uh, to answer this question, I'm going to explore the classic idea that information-driven trading, as opposed to liquidity-driven trading, implies persistent price changes. Uh, and my main empirical result is kind of summarized in a stylized fashion in the small chart at the bottom of the slide. So if we consider, for instance, uh, some bonds that whose price went up on trading day one, and this has a benchmark, we say that on this trading day one, trading volume was fairly low, we're going to observe a fairly strong price reversal afterwards. So on day two, price is going to go down, and the reversal is roughly negative one third. So I'm going to put a particular number and show you how to, how, how to do that. However, if we instead consider uh, day one 
with very high, abnormally high trading volume, we're going to see that prices tend to be a bit more persistent. So these two points on the chart, uh, they show that following abnormally high volume day, prices, bond prices tend to be a bit more persistent. However, if we distinguish further abnormally high volume days into days when dealers trade from their own books, so if they buy this 10 million of bond and hold it overnight on their books, the reversal is a bit lower, sorry, a bit stronger than in the opposite case when dealers just offset this trade immediately within the same trading day. So this top point on the chart, the one that has uh, the highest persistence or persistence, I'm sorry, or the lowest reversal is exactly the situation when dealers offset the trades and let someone else provide liquidity. In this particular case, some other bond investors become liquidity providers, and in this case, bond prices are the most persistent. This is basically the punchline of this paper. Um, so now let me show you a bit, uh, a bit more uh, how, I, how I get there. So my main empirical analysis proceeds in two steps. In the first step, I basically model the uh, time varying return auto correlation, bond return auto correlation, uh, which is here a function of uh, two linear function of two types of trading volume. What I call client to client volume is essentially the volume that dealers offset within the same trading. And client to dealer volume is just not changing dealer's inventory. So I estimate this relationship for individual corporate bonds. And on the second step, I try to explain the cross section uh, of the coefficients in this relationship with different information symmetry proxies. So the idea is that, um, uh, you know, with higher information asymmetry, these coefficients should differ. And they differ and uh, they change in a particular way. Uh, that is implied by a model which I uh, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So let me first uh, uh, talk about the the meaning of the coefficients in this volume return relationship. So beta one here is the average uh, average reversal. Beta two and beta three measure how the average reversal changes following high volume days. Um, so this two-step procedure that I have here it doesn't actually fall from the sky. It follows from a particular model of bond trading volume that I set up and solved in the paper. Uh, and the first step is basically the equilibrium relationship in the model. It tells you how the kinematrician observing the data generated by a model under particular assumptions should forecast returns on the daily level. And the second step is the sort of cross, um, uh, I'm sorry, comparative statics exercise within the model. Uh, that establishes the footprint of information-driven trading as opposed to liquidity-driven trading. So in particular, the model suggests that uh, as information-driven trading becomes more and more likely, the loading on the type of volume that conveys this information-driven trading should increase with information asymmetry. And that's exactly what I find empirically. So the chart on this slide basically summarizes the main empirical result in a full-fledged way. So this beta two, the loading on client to client volume is strongly increasing with information asymmetry. And that indeed suggests that following high client to client volume days, prices tend to be fairly more persistent for bonds with the highest information asymmetry, right? Um, so in terms, of, in terms of contributions to the literature, uh, today I'm focusing on, on, uh, on this non-deal liquidity provision uh, in corporate bonds topic. Um, so my discussion today, Eddie has a, a great paper with Michael on that, so I'm sure she, she's going to comment uh, about that more in detail. But basically, my main contribution to this literature, I believe, is that I established that non-deal liquidity providers in American corporate bonds are less likely, uh, sorry, more likely to be adversely selected. They are more likely to face uh, informed traders. Uh, the paper doesn't... Uh, dig deeper into the particular, the particular economic mechanism that might stay behind. But if I can speculate in a couple of sentences, I would say the main reason is the uh, what I call non-anonymity of trading, right? So dealers have the first hand in this market, so they know exactly who they're trading with. And if they suspect that there might be information behind, they would be eager uh, to pass the trade to someone else. So if that's what, what's going on, we, I show Today I will show you empirically, but I can also show it in a fairly stylized theoretical model. Uh, we would expect to see something uh, that I showed you on the previous slide. So uh, liquidity providers who are not dealers become, uh, uh, they become a bridge uh, 
there are additional contributions, I believe, to uh, the general topic of price efficiency in corporate bonds and uh, uh, cross-sectional bond pricing uh, factors, but uh, this will be of less importance today. So now let me jump into uh, the particular methodology I'm using. So the data is fairly standard. So this is trace data, uh, aggregated to daily frequency. Uh, the uh, sample is uh, post prices as of now. And the, uh, the sample is essentially plain vanilla corporate bonds. So they are fixed coupon and convertible non asset back more than one year to maturity. So now, uh, the first step of my analysis suggests uh, a particular time series relationship, which I need to estimate. Uh, and to estimate something in a time series, I need to have this time series in the first place, uh, which is a bit of an issue for corporate bonds because they are fairly infrequently traded. So to make sure that the time series is uh, uh, sort of long enough uh, and dense enough, uh, I define what I call active trading periods. So the active trading periods will be uh, sequences of at least 60, uh, 60 trading days where every two consecutive trading days are at most three business days apart. So if we say, see, the bond is traded on Monday and the next time on Thursday, that still works. But if the bond is traded following the trade on Monday only on Friday, we say that this is no longer an active trading period and we completely disregard this, uh, this part of the trace data. Uh, I further require uh, bonds to not jump uh, from high yield to investment grade territory and back uh, to make sure that within the next period to make sure that my results are not driven by uh, mechanical uh, rebalancing around, around index exposures. Uh, this leaves me with about 5,000 individual corporate bonds. Uh, this is roughly one third of my initial sample. Uh, I have some cross section in terms of issuers. Uh, the bonds are issued by about 1,000 firms. Uh, and so this is the sample. And now I'd like to talk about two types of trading volumes that, that are basically two main variables in, in, in my analysis. So what I call client to client volume uh, is, well, as I said, just the volume that is offset by dealers as a whole uh, within the same trading day. So if we observe in some bond I on day T, uh, say a buy volume of 10 and a sell volume of eight, then the minimum of these two numbers will be the client to client volume. So 8 million will be client to client volume on this particular day in this particular bond. For geometric purposes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, normalize, normalize this thing per bond for active period, right? So uh, this B tilde C uh, of one will be one standard deviation above average uh, client to client volume in this particular bond, in this particular. Uh, client to dealer volume is just the change in dealer's inventory. Right, so going back to this simple numerical example, if the buy volume is 10, sell volume is 8, the client to dealer volume will be 2. Uh, and then for basically for exposition purposes, I impose uh, symmetry. So I take the absolute value. So I'm going to treat uh, the target inventory above and below equally uh, in, in, in this study. Um, uh, so, and, and then I also going to normalize this thing uh, for bond practice period. Right. The results go through if I don't impose symmetry, but telling this story becomes a little bit more uh, complicated in this case. So, uh, this is just the, uh, the simplifying assumption for presentation purposes. So now this is the uh, the first step, uh, what I call volume return relationship for individual bonds. Again, this is a this is an equilibrium relationship in a particular type of model which I won't have time to talk about today because of the 30 minute rule, but uh, essentially what I model here is the uh, time varying return for the correlation in bond prices. So this part in red is the uh, first order correlation of bond prices, of bond returns, I'm sorry, on the daily level. And as I, as I have shown before, it's, uh, it's a linear function of the two types of trading volume. Uh, if we estimate this thing um, for, for individual bonds, we find that Beta one, again, this is the average price reversal, is about negative one third. So if the price drops today by 100 basis points, it goes up tomorrow by 33 basis points, uh, which is by itself a lot. And that's why I have this part on pricing implications of my results, uh, which hopefully I will have a couple of minutes to talk about today. But 
uh, bottom line, reversals are huge, but they become less and less pronounced uh, as trading volume increases. So this loading on two types of volume, beta two and beta three, there are there are they are both positive, um, and they are positive for 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 most bonds. Uh, but the main idea behind my analysis is that this this loadings, this beta two and beta three they should be aligned with information symmetry in the cross-section of bonds. So what we're gonna do next, we're gonna take the, um, the cross-section of this estimated betas, this part, and see whether uh, uh, beta two and beta three are aligned with information, underlying information symmetry in the cross-section of bonds. The idea is that, you know, if uh, these two types of trading volume, client to client and client to dealer, have the same informational content, then we shouldn't find much differences in the second uh, cross-section step. If we instead find substantial differences and have beta two and beta three differ in the cross-section of bonds, uh, then it's a, it's, a, it's a point for concern and for consideration, and I'm gonna interpret these differences as the evidence of information-driven trading in one particular type of volume. Here is the second step. So this, on the second step, I set explanatory models to the cross-section of these betas. Uh, separately for each of three of them. Um, the information asymmetry proxies that I'm going to be using are, are as follows. First of all, it's the number of funds, uh, number of mutual funds that own a particular bond. Uh, the idea here is straightforward. So if, uh, say, a bond is owned by 100 mutual funds, as opposed to a bond that is owned by two mutual funds, uh, in the second bond, there is more room for information-driven trading, for some price inefficiencies, and so on and so forth. Uh, similar logic applies to the uh, uh, number of dealers that intimidate trades in a given bond on average. So the idea is that you know, the bond that is intimidated by 30 dealers on average uh, is, uh, has less room for um, information trading as opposed to the bond that is intimidated by a single dealer somewhere at the periphery of the to the network. Uh, then there is a CDS dummy. So here the effect is mechanical. Uh, I basically say that, you know, if there is an actively traded CDS contract on the bond issuer, then uh, some guys that might have uh, private credit information will be able to trade in the CDS market rather than the corporate bond market simply because it's cheaper to trade CDSs than cash bonds, right? So part of the informed volume will go to the CDS market. And as a result, the likelihood of information-driven trading in a cash bond will be lower. Uh, then there is issue size and issuer size. These are classic information asymmetry proxies for these types of studies. The idea is that you know, bonds, issued, bonds with large outstanding amounts issued by bigger firms uh, potentially um, are less prone uh, to, to information-driven trading. And finally, uh, I use equity volatility uh, measured uh, in the exact active periods when the bonds are actively traded and where uh, when betas, volume return coefficients are measured. Uh, the idea basically is that if the, the, the private information that someone is trading on uh, is at the firm level, then it should be present in the equity market as well as in the bond market. So if we see a higher equity volatility uh, uh, in a particular active period, it's more likely that there is information driven trading going on in the cash bond simultaneously. Uh, and that's why, you know, the, the equity volatility is with a negative sign in this list of proxies, which basically suggests that, you know, when all these information asymmetry proxies have higher readings, the underlying information asymmetry is supposedly lower. Now, if we follow the logic that, you know, we should observe whenever stronger reversals for high asymmetry bonds, then we would, have, would expect the beta one uh, sorry, the loadings on this information asymmetry proxies and the regression for beta one to be positive. The effect for uh, the, the expected sign for beta two and the regression for beta two is the opposite, right? So we say that you know on average reversal is stronger for high symmetry bonds, but as volume increases, uh, uh, returns become more and more persistent for high symmetry bonds. So for for beta two, uh, we expect the sign that is opposite to the sign to the loadings on beta one, so it's negative. And then if our logic is correct, and dealers uh, basically only, well, tend to pass the bonds when they suspect information-driven trading, 
and are happy to provide liquidity if they are sure that this is just liquidity-driven trading, then there should be no association between uh, estimated beta-3 and information asymmetry proxies in the cross-section of bonds. There is a number of controls in the second stage regression. Um, uh, so let me start from the back. Bond volatility and credit rating just ensure that we are dealing with a bond uh, that we control for the bond riskiness. Uh, volume correlations are here to make sure that we are not capturing the sort of repetitive price impact. If, say, just you know, some mutual fund keeps rebalancing over uh, you know, several weeks, so they will just have repetitive price impact, which will uh, uh, show show up as persistent price changes, uh, but it's actually just you know some mechanical uh, splitting out of the trades over over longer horizons. And finally, which is probably the uh, the most important part, is the uh, average realized bid ask spreads. Right? Because for for this kind of volume return analysis, the uh, microstructure concerns are of high priority. So maybe what I'm pick, picking up here is just the bid ask bounce. So there is no perfect way to control for that because there is no uh, mid quote available for, for transactional uh, trace data. But the idea is that you know at least I can control for the realized average realized bid ask spreads um, in the cross sectional bonds and make sure that the um, that what I showed here empirically goes above and beyond uh, the um, ex post remuneration for liquidity provision. Um, all right, so this was the uh, this is the design of the study, and here are the results. So this is the cross section cross sectional regression of estimated beta one and information symmetry proxies. So the average value is is about negative one third, um, as we as we talked already. And then we were expecting positive loadings on all this information symmetry proxies. Of course, none of this information symmetry proxies is perfect, but what we essentially see in this table is that all of them have positive loadings exactly as we expected, and all but one are significant. We can also include them all together in this regression. Uh, the results, uh, the results will essentially hold. Right. So now, if we turn to the um, uh, to the cross-sectional regression for beta two, uh, again, the loadings for beta two should be the opposite of the opposite sign, and that's exactly what we find. Uh, so the loadings on all this information symmetry proxies are negative. They are significant for all but one, uh, the equity volatility. And interestingly, if we include all of them uh, in the second in the second in the second step of analysis, we basically still see lots of significance uh, for for almost all of this asymmetry proxies, which I believe suggests that. There are different dimensions of um, information-driven trading. So someone might be trading on, on, say, private credit information that would be firm level. Someone might be trading on particular uh, bond mispricings or, say, better valuation of embedded bond options. So that is bond level, and that would be captured uh, by uh, uh, bond-specific information symmetry proxies. Right. Uh, and finally, if we turn uh, to the results for beta three, which is the sensitivity of the average reversal to pi and to dealer volume, which uh, we expect to be uh, less less likely to be informed, right, or to be mostly about, uh, driven by liquidity trading, uh, we find that well, some loadings and information asymmetry proxies are still positive, some turn negative, some become insignificant. If we include them all together, we basically see nothing here, right? So exactly as we expected. The loadings on uh, client to dealer volume and the cross section of bonds are seemingly unrelated to uh, underlying information symmetry uh, in, in, in these bonds. So I think a, a picture speaks louder than you know, three tables with a thousand numbers. So this essentially summarizes the, uh, the three tables that I presented before. So I take the models, the, the models for, for betas from the previous slides. And use them uh, to plot uh, expected levels of volume return coefficients uh, uh, amid uh, changing information symmetry. Right? So the panel for beta one uh, shows that you know for bonds with a higher information symmetry, reversals are on average about twice stronger than for bonds with lowest information symmetry. So there is a, if I may, a gap in reversals between high and low symmetry bonds on average. But this, this gap is closing uh, following high client-to-client volume dates. 
and more so for bonds with the highest information signature. There is no such effect for beta T. So the, uh, the average expected value for, for, for beta three for high and low asymmetry bonds is essentially identical. Right? So the, the empirical results that I have shown are fairly robust to uh, different tweaks in the first and the second stage. So we can include a bunch of additional factors in the first stage. We can um, take better care of um, estimation errors in the second stage. In particular, we can just, instead of uh, using the average values of information symmetry proxies, we can take initial observations of information symmetry proxies, so some sort of ex ante information asymmetry uh, in the second stage, which is just observed. It's not, it's not measured. So there will be no estimation error on the right-hand side in the second stage, which, make, which makes the result stronger. And we can also try to deal with, uh, with the microstructure issues, for instance, by um, instead of prices to compute returns, we can take a simple average between volume weighted by itself. Uh, that's, not a, that's not precisely a mid quote, but it's getting closer. And uh, you can see if you click on, 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 on this thing that the results are virtually identical in this particular case. Great. So I have a couple of minutes. I will briefly uh, sketch the implication for pricing. Uh, this will be the implication by beta one. So for beta one, we found that you know, for high symmetry bonds, beta one is more negative. It observes stronger reversals on average, uh, which basically suggests that someone who is uh, trying to construct reversal portfolios in corporate bonds um, can additionally condition on underlying information asymmetry to improve performance. Uh, and long story short, I will jump straight away to this table. The average reversal portfolio on, say, low asymmetry bonds earns about 160 basis points per year, uh, net of trading costs, uh, which is an estimate, of course. Uh, on high asymmetry bonds, the, um, uh, the return is about 150 basis points higher. So uh, we, you can show uh, empirically that this 150 basis points is not fully explained by the exposure to uh, a market portfolio or something like that. Uh, so uh, if I recall correctly, about uh, 100 basis points of the 150 number that I quoted uh, is, uh, can be attributed to uh, pure adverse selection risk. So which basically suggests that uh, the returns on reversal portfolios extend above and beyond the remuneration for, for, for liquidity, uh, illiquidity, and uh, uh, Basically, uh, there is a substantial portion that is due to adverse selection premium. Uh, so I'm, I'm slightly ahead of time, but I guess uh, that's fine. Uh, so I'm ready to conclude. Basically, the, uh, the, main, the main result of this, of this study is that, uh, that I tried to show you today is that non deal liquidity providers in American corporate bonds uh, are more likely to face informed traders. They are more likely to be adversely selected. Uh, by itself, it implies that there is information-driven trading uh, in American corporate bonds with investment-grade ones, which might be an interesting result by itself. Uh, and I quickly sketched the implications for constructing bond reversal portfolios, which might be interesting for uh, cross-sectional bond pricing uh, uh, audience. So that's it on my side. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alexi. Um, so I think we can uh, turn it over to Edie for her discussion. Okay. Okay, all good? Okay. All good. Great, and you'll, you'll uh, keep an eye on the time for me so I don't have to keep looking over at my clock. <laughs> sure, I can do that. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, but so thank, thank you uh, all, of, all of the organizers here uh, for giving me the chance to, to discuss the paper. It's uh, very interesting. So, oh, it looks like I've got some uh, unexpected uh, animation going on here which I don't care about. All right, so um, I know that Alexei is in the middle of rewriting the paper and um, uh, is now stressing kind of this, this adverse selection risk more so than is in the current draft. And so I wanted to step back and just try and 
think about um, how overall, um, you know, what, what you're trying to achieve in the paper fits in with what we uh, do already know about trading uh, in corporate bonds and, and what we're still struggling to know that perhaps your study best helps us with. Um, so it's a very interesting idea to use the observed reversals to try and learn something about whether there's, uh, whether they reflect information-based trading or, or liquidity-based trading. So um, knowing that there's reversals in, in corporate bonds isn't new. There's uh, several studies that try and look at this long-term. That's really not the focus of, of what you're talking about here, but um, we, we do also know to some extent that we, we observe these short-term reversals. Um, there's also a reasonably extensive literature that's showing us that um, there is information-based trading in corporate bonds, even at times in investment-grade bonds. Um, along with that, going way back on the theoretical side, we, we know um, to expect permanent price impact from uh, information-based trading and the negative serial correlation from uh, liquidity or uninformed trading. So there's, there's two possible paths uh, in this paper. One, one is simply demonstrating uh, when do we believe information-based trading is important. Um, I think the more interesting, which is what Alexei is now emphasizing, is to think about how uh, dealers are responding to adverse selection risk. Okay, so um, one more thing that we also know by now about uh, bond trading up to now, corporate bond trading, is that um, we, we've seen dealers' capital commitment decline recently, but also vary over time. So uh, respond to periods of stress, response, uh, respond to the crisis, respond to changes in transparency. And um, the idea that Michael and I had in our JFD paper was that we can um, think of these prearranged trades as an endogenous response to changes in dealers' funding costs or changing uh, particularly in inventory risk. And, and because of this endogenous behavior, when you look at observed spreads, it's, it's, it's difficult to um, interpret them. Um, for example, you can see very small spreads on uh, relatively illiquid issues. And, and what's, um, and maybe I'm biased, but I think particularly clever about this paper is what Alexi is doing is he's thinking about how this endogenous change in dealers' behavior um, is also reflecting their um, attempts to mitigate adverse selection risk by um, prearranging the trains and not, trades and not taking inventory. So he writes down a model, um, not because we necessarily want to pick apart all the assumptions going into the model, but um, the point is that if we assume dealers are acting in this way, um, it leads to an empirical specification, which is very much what he's, he estimates in this paper. So um, I think it's a, a clever idea to think of it in, in this way. And, and it's nicely summarized in this chart that um, Alexi put up, which again, he went through, so I won't go through it in a whole, whole lot of detail here, but um, the small dotted line would be the case where you have the strongest reversals because there's no adverse selection risk, so you have market makers being compensated for providing liquidity, whereas the, the dark line going uh, straight across the, the, the top here is where the dealers are pre-arranging trades to avoid the adverse selection component. And um, when you do have concern about adverse selection and more informed trading, that's when you're getting the permanent price impact. So the permanent price impact here, we're not, we're not getting the same degree of reversals. So it's very intuitive. Um, and like I said, that leads into the empirical specification, um, which is, again, Alexi summarizes quite nicely, but um, if we want to look at these, uh, um, autocorrelations here, you get the negative beta one, meaning the reversals that we would observe on average, but then also relating that to the, the change in the reversal when uh, for beta two, dealers are offsetting everything immediately, meaning the dealers are unwilling to take inventory because they don't want to take on that adverse selection risk. And then the change in the reversal um, in, in the, the trading where dealers are increasing or decreasing inventory. And that these coefficients should be related to proxies for information asymmetry uh, in the way that the, the model suggests. So for example, um, on the average days, the dealers are being compensated for providing liquidity, particularly when there's more information asymmetry, but those reversals are less strong when we look, especially at beta two, when uh, 
the dealers are detecting informed traders and therefore F offsetting everything um, more immediately and not a whole lot going on with, with beta three. So um, th these couple of figures, I think very nicely summarize uh, the paper um, in a nutshell. Okay, so um, I don't have a, a lot of, well, I don't have any comments on the model because I think that the, the model achieves its purpose quite, um, quite clearly. Um, and the point is that, like I said, not to pick apart the assumptions. Um, just a, a couple comments on um, what I'll call the boatload of proxies for information asymmetry. Um, the idea here is we want to try and focus on the periods or, or the, the, the observations of trading where we think adverse selection is, is most likely to be an issue. And it seems like there's a limitless number of, of potential proxies here, but um, I I don't know that my in immediate interpretation or expectation was uh, the same as the Lexi's, although they all seem to be borne out in the data and producing you know, very robust results here. So for example, if you have um, fewer mutual fund uh, owners or you know, less dispersed ownership, concern about more information driven trade, Again, that wasn't wasn't obvious to me. If you you know think back again to more traditional models where I have more active or liquid markets, that's where the informed traders are going to go. So, um, I guess my my suggestion on a number of these is, and and this doesn't change anything empirically, but I was a bit more agnostic perhaps than uh, than you might have been on a, on a couple of these. Um, one of them that I'm a little con more concerned about is. Uh, you're using an indicator for whether there's an active CDS contract. Um, given the robustness and the potential for all these other measures, th th this is the one that's causing your sample to shrink considerably, um, meaning you can only look at this in 2010 plus. So I'm not sure I see a strong uh, advantage to including that and, and so on. Um, so like I said, I think I, m my issue with all of these is I'm not sure which ones to view as your proxies for information asymmetry versus um, others that you're treating as just controls in the regression. For example, um, proxies for rating, credit spread, and so on. Um, I, I might suggest simply um, using some of these in terms of fixed effects and trying to see if there's interesting things within uh, some of these groups here. Um, another small thing I'll mention is that my, my priors were that the uh, particularly interesting ones would be to compare public and private firms where you do and don't have listed equity. And you, you do that as a robustness check and don't find anything there, whereas I thought that would highlight things most clearly. Um, and stock volatility was probably the other one that I expected to be particularly interesting to look at. It might be because you need to look at stock volatility just up until the time of the trade. But the, the other issue with stock volatility is um, you, you also have to worry when you're talking about bonds, not equity, about the leverage of the company. So it may be that you, you're better off using something like a distance to default. But in any event, um, there's just a multitude of possibilities here. Um, get a little swamped by some of them and maybe just doing some simpler specifications with rating fixed effects would make your, your point equally nicely. Um, second issue has to do with these active periods. Um, I don't have terrific suggestions how to get apart from this because I do understand you need uh, quite a bit of observations to be able to estimate this. But, but it does um, limit your sample quite a bit um, to require uh, within the 60 days, um, you have two successive observations that are never more than three days apart. So you're ending up with a median of three, sorry, sorry, median of, of six trades per day in these bonds. It's very much skewing you towards extremely actively traded bonds. And um, the issue here again is it, it, we know again from our other work that it's the higher information asymmetry bonds, which includes the less actively traded bonds, where we have to worry quite a bit more about the potential for informed trading, lower grade bonds and so on. So, you know, again, I don't have a terrific solution except perhaps, you know, get rid of the um, requiring a CDS contract so that you could look at a longer time period. But um, when you're dealing with trying to estimate these sort of correlations, that's probably the best you can do. Um, but I would think a little bit more about what's driving these um, high volume periods um, besides just things like lower grade bonds, uh, having more information asymmetry and so on. And, and we know that trading is extremely um, episodic and event driven in this market. There, there's a nice paper, which I'll, I'll send you separately in um, Journal of Accounting and Economics, that they, they actually looked at 
debt analyst reports. And unlike equities, which are constantly updating as we get closer to next earnings releases, these, even these, these debt reports themselves um, come out very much in response to um, information about credit. So it, it's kind of a different market in that sense where things are much more episodic. So it, it might be interesting for you in, in an alternative specification than defining these windows to think about what's happening prior to, not, not afterwards as much of the other literature does, but um, think about what's happening prior to the earnings releases or prior to the downgrades within investment grade or high yield, because that's where you may have some really interesting pre-event uh, dis, uh, differences in interpretation or differences in expectations, uh, differences in information. And, and that, that could be quite interesting to look at. Um, your specifications don't really give you the opportunity, although you could easily incorporate it, to, to think about other um, market-wide changes and uncertainty, changes in dealer funding costs and so on that are at the same time, in addition to changes in adverse selection, going to affect um, the dealer's behavior, uh, designing to offset. Um, and then there's kind of the last piece on here. Um, I think there's some interesting things you could also do to exploit the asymmetries here in that, especially for investment grade bonds, the downside risk is, is much more relevant. Um, and that might help you rule out some alternative explanations or alternative models that could also uh, drive these type of reversals. So I was trying to think of some examples, but it might be that the, um, the dealer itself in some instances is, is they're the ones that have the information and thinking about how that affects their behavior, um, perhaps asymmetrically and, and so on. Um, I think that would be interesting to, to exploit. Uh, I didn't quite understand your, your you, you go a little bit in that direction in one of your figures. I won't go into details here, but I, I wasn't quite sure why you set that up the way you did. Um, and then a few more kind of less uh, critical things I would say. Um, let me see if I can uh, pick off one or two of them. The, w when you have very high volume, um, it's also just easier to naturally offset order flow. So that volume doesn't necessarily um, imply uh, more adverse selection. It's just you get, you, you get more matching of trading simply because it's easier to offset. And, and you do see, because of that, a bit different behavior for the you know, more actively or more constantly actively traded uh, investment grade bonds versus others. Um, let's see. And, and again, I would just say be, be a little bit careful in where you are trying to interpret or control for the bid ask spread because of this ex endogeneity of reason itself. Um, maybe you could think about another explanation, um, such as, uh, sorry, another alternative variable like using non zero trading days, something like that, um, which doesn't necessarily have the, the problem that the bid ask spread does. Um, a couple of things that we can talk about offline, but um, overall, I just thought it was a really clever idea to think about how um, dealers are uh, changing their behavior in response to the adverse selection risk. And, and that, uh, again, we, we, it's difficult to uh, see that, as, as we show in our other paper, but by looking at spreads. So your idea about using the behavior reversals to get at this is, I thought, quite clever. Um, and again, you, you see these patterns of reversals that we can't necessarily explain uh, easily from some uh, other models. Um, just a couple of complications if I were to throw at you. Um, why might dealers take on adverse selection risk anyway? Um, we know that dealing with relationship investors, important clients, is a, is a big deal in this market. So there may be instances where um, it could help you explain, uh, you know, why they seem to take on, on risk in some situations. Uh, I already mentioned these issues about just being a bit cautious about um, how you interpret or use spreads empirically. Um, I, again, I already mentioned looking pre-event uh, could be an interesting alternative to looking at these active periods and thinking more about the upside versus downside risk. Um, as you were talking, I thought of kind of one more uh, thought idea, maybe not even for this paper, how you could get at this. But um, I think it'd also be interesting to look at dealers' behavior on these uh, request for quote platforms matches nicely into the ideas that you're talking about, because um, there you have the opportunity where you can see um, which dealers are being queried 
and then um, see the response, both in terms of pricing and whether they respond at all. And um, if that depends on the nature of the client and, uh, and whether they're concerned about adverse selection risk with that client, that would be a really interesting task that would kind of be an alternative to, or alongside of what you're doing. But uh, it's a really interesting idea. And uh, thank you for letting me discuss. Excellent. Thank you very much, Edie. That was a great discussion. Um, so for the next 15 minutes or so, we'll do an open Q&A. So we've enabled the raise hand function. So you should be able to raise your hand um, if you want to ask Alexi questions directly. Um, while we're waiting for some people to raise hands, if they have questions, uh, there's a couple that are in here in the chat. Um, so if the people have them in the chat, um, it would be nice if you would read those. Um, oh, we have uh, Michael Goldstein. Yeah, you should be able to uh, unmute yourself, Michael. Thank you. Um, although I, I don't want to preempt the people in the chat. Uh, I, I had some very basic questions. I hope I apologize for them being so basic. But in figure two, it would be helpful to know exact two things I think would be very helpful to know. One is exactly what are the, the dots. I believe they're trades. So they're a trade between, say, a customer and a dealer at the first one. Then, and I'm, I'm curious, is it kind of, is it on average or is it trying to trace what a trade would, as, as if a hundred bonds traded one time, a second time and a third time. So just to that, that graph itself would be very helpful to suss it out, whether it's flowing, watching a flow across uh, basically a single set of, of transactions or kind of on average. And the reason why I'm asking that uh, is a, a couple fold, just to give you some ideas. Um, the, the, the first one is the first, if they're trades, then the first two complete what I'd call a, you know, somehow a round trip. Um, it's, I'm still not totally clear what happens if that happened during the day. But then the next one, supposing it's a market and people are buying, uh, why wouldn't that just be bid, ask, bounce? That's kind of my first kind of like, all right, you know, I, I it, there's a you're buying at the bid, you're selling at the ask, and the next trade is another buy at the bid because people are buying, and so why might that be surprising? Um, second question, second comment is um, I actually think that graph would be very interesting to show not normalizing on the second trade, but normalizing on the first trade. Uh, it's possible that the second trade, when you buy it from a customer and it goes, and the second trade's to a customer that that's a whole lot lower just on the whole scale than if it ends up giving a customer and then you have to retain it. So that actually would be a huge amount of information about, um, it may be true it goes down less later on, but it started from a low base to begin with. Um, so I just think that'd be a fascinating uh, figure to show maybe from the first trade normalization as opposed to the second trade normalization, um, because that gives you a better feel for the drop down later. Well, where does that bring you relative to the um, the actual price of the first trade. And then and then third, just a side comment, because I saw it come up a lot of time is, you know, realized spreads, even if you go to Wikipedia, they say that realized spreads include, um, you know, asymmetric information, uh, uh, you know, something for this. So uh, just be wary. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to move to trades from returns there is that, hey, already the, our method in, in this field without midpoints and quotes is that we're already capturing some of this issue in our measure of, of uh, spreads. All right, that was a long time, sorry. Okay, do you have a, do you have a comments you'd like to respond to, Alexi, about that? Uh, yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the comments and the suggestions. Um, uh, about normalization, I, I, will, I will try to show it this way. That's, uh, uh, that's very well taken, for sure. Uh, with regards to bid-ask balance, I guess that's basically both the first and the third question together. <laughs> Uh, so just basically, you know, uh, it's obviously one of the uh, one of the main and tempting explanations to the uh, figure two, as 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 you pointed out. Uh, there is no easy way around because well, we don't observe mid quotes uh, again. Um, I I agree that uh, realized the is uh, well, they do contain uh, asymmetric information. Sure, uh, that's why I use them as as the control in the second stage is not a good control. But if you kind of if 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 we follow Eddie's uh, Eddie's suggestion and just you know try to be agnostic and just put realize the desks there and see you know whether 
what, what pops up actually works exactly as you would expect as information sim free proxy, which is not surprising again, because as you said, they contain uh, asymmetric information. Uh, with regards to um, uh, what's what's on figure two, well, this is this is the average. This, these are the average paths. I fully agree with you. Uh, it would be it would be much better to trace uh, kind of to find a, a, a particular set of set of bonds or trades and see how in this particular set uh, this thing uh, changes as a sort of anecdotal evidence. And uh, I'll I'll try to do that. That's a, that's a very useful suggestion. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we don't have other hands raised, but we do have questions uh, in the chat. So I'll, I'll go through those. Um, so uh, the first question here is, it's anonymous because we didn't disable the anonymous question thing. I think it's Chester. I'm going to guess like it's 20% that it's Chester based on writing style. Um, so the question is, is the three-day separation criterion required to be present throughout the trading period? Or is there one instance where trades are so timed within the period? So I think Edie touched on this a little bit during our discussion. Um, I'm not totally sure I get the question, but I, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Uh, well, yeah, so the, the, the idea is that it should be present throughout the entire, the entire trading period, right? So the, the, the two consecutive trading days should be uh, at most three business days apart, but the results are not critical with regard to that. So we can make it like consecutive trading days, but then the sample will shrink even further. And then we go back to Eddie's point that uh, the sample will be naturally skewed towards the most actively traded investment grade bonds where information concerns are of less importance in the first place. Um, so extending the window, I mean, extending the, uh, the gap between consecutive trading days will uh, make the sample broader, but then there are concerns, you know, maybe there are some some material changes between these trading days and, and the sample is not really uh, the same as, as it was at, the, at day T, right? So that's, uh, that's the concern. Okay. Um, so this next question is like actually from Chester because at this point we had disabled anonymous posting. Um, so um, why wouldn't the presence of active CDS suggest more private information, which would manifest itself in both cash bond as well as CDS? either could lead to the other, rather than the CDS necessarily being a substitute for cash trading um, uh, if there's lots of information. And so how does your design handle this? I, I kind of had this question too about, about the CDS relationship to asymmetry. Sure. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. The, uh, the, um, uh, the interpretation of uh, uh, the existence of an actively traded CDS contract as an information symmetry proxy is uh, sort of dubious, and uh, that that was Eddie's point as well. And actually, if you look at the results, <laughs> the CDS is uh, one of the weakest <laughs> proxies, so maybe I should drop it altogether. The short answer to Chester's question is no. My design doesn't handle it uh, explicitly at this stage. Whether you know uh, CDS, the existence of CDS induces information-driven trading uh, in cash bonds or not. I assume that it doesn't, but uh, I mean. It's just an assumption. Okay. Um, and Chester has raised his hand. Sorry if you raised your hand earlier and I missed it. Um, you can unmute yourself, Chester. Well, well I, I just uh, I, so I, pre I appreciate to the answer to my question on CDS, and I and I just wanted to say that I'm um, that I'm not. You know, there was a famous person called Anonymous and who wrote a book in the Bill Clinton era. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not anonymous. Um, so I did not pose the initial question, and maybe one ought to think, oh, is it, is it, but it's a good idea to disable because um, uh, that facilitates, you know, we talk about adverse selection. I mean, it was, a good, it was a good question, but, you know, we worry about adverse selection in prices, so we also, we shouldn't have anonymous questions because then we might have adverse selection in questions, but that was a, but the anonymous question was a good question. Sorry for the misattribution, Chester. Yeah. Okay, um, so, the, <laughs> so the next question is from Kumar um, uh, Venkataraman. Um, did you examine asymmetry in price impact of dealers versus buy, buy or sell and how it relates with um, principal versus agency trading? Um, and he notes that there's um, a recent literature that shows price impact asymmetry. Uh. Yeah, so this is a very good question. Thanks, Kumar. Uh, I might have a slide that um, 
or it's not in the slide deck. No, it's not in the slide deck. Well, I, 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 have a, uh, I have a graph in the picture that kind of goes towards that. I think Eddie mentioned that as well. There are some asymmetries. Um, I didn't yeah, I certainly should, so thank you for the suggestion. I will, I will, I will do that as well. Thank you. Cameron, sorry if you're oh, talking. Sorry. I cannot hear you, sorry. But the funny part about that was the whole time I was muted, I was telling you that you we lost you in the middle of your <laughs> ah, all right. <laughs> we didn't all get right. to hear about the second half of your uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Sorry about that. I, 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 I can readily repeat. So the um I I I looked into uh the asymmetries in uh, in in price and tax for following uh, dealer buys versus dealer sells. Uh, it's not the uh, central the central part of the paper yet, but uh, given that I'm rewriting it now uh, in this particular uh, adverse from this particular adverse selection standpoint, I certainly should look more into that. So uh, thanks a lot. I will I will certainly do that. Okay. Uh, I don't see any more raised hands, and we don't have anything further in the Q and A. Um, so if anybody has any further voice questions, you can raise your hand. Um, if not, then we'll you know kind of conclude for the day, and then everybody can relax on Bastille Day, because um, that's a very important thing that everyone should do, I guess. Um, okay, I don't see further hands. Okay, so thank you very much, Alexi and Edie, um, and we'll hope to see you next week. I don't remember who who we have next week. Um, it's on the website. It'll be on the website soon, and we'll send out an email. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Alexi, and thank you, Edie. Everyone have a Thank lovely you. day.